Let people roll in here. get started in just a minute. Okay, it looks like we have a little bit of leveling off. Attendees rolling in. So welcome to today's WCET webcast. This webcast is being recorded and you'll be able to access a link to the recording as well as any resources that are shared and we'll put a link to the PowerPoint in the in the chat. Today's webinar is digital learnings regulatory outlook and we have amazing panelists today. I'd like to uh, quickly just address a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into the panel. But if you have any questions throughout the presentation, enter them into the Q&A. If you have comments or resources to share, enter them into the chat. It's important not to enter your questions into the chat because they do tend to get lost. We try and manage that, but they often get overlooked. So put them in the Q&A. If we get more questions than we have time for today, we'll pull those out. We'll share those with the presenters and get written responses back to you. We'll hold Q&A until the end, and hopefully we have plenty of time for all your questions. If we see a question come up repetitively that we need to address, we'll certainly jump in and get to that. We'll also be looking for your questions and comments on Twitter, and that hashtag is WCETWebcast. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, BITAC, for making closed captions available for this live webinar. And uh, just remind you to put your questions in the Q&A, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our moderator today, who is Russ Poulin, the Executive Director at WCET. Welcome, Russ. Excellent, and thank you so much, Megan, and, and thank you for, for everyone for coming to be part of this webcast. Uh, uh, probably many of you probably heard that there was an election recently uh, in the U.S., a national election, and uh, with the uh, Biden victory that there some changes may be happening with the, with the new administration. And, Today we wanted to look at what might happen uh, uh, with the elections, yay, with the elections and the uh, ever-present pandemic in terms of what what might be happening in the uh, in the coming year. Uh, with that, I'll turn to uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the uh, folks who are going to lead you through this today, and I'll start with uh, Van Davis, and he'll be talking about uh, what the Biden administration might bring in terms of both general higher education policy, but also uh, uh, since we are WCET about the uh, digital learning and tech policy uh, as well. Uh, Van is WCT's policy and planning consultant and he's the principal at Fogelman Consulting. Uh, Van also coordinated our work on creating our new uh, policy playbook. Uh, talking about the policy playbook will be Cheryl Dowd, uh, director of WCT's state authorization network. Uh, and she'll give highlights about the, about the playbook which was uh, uh, produced with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and was produced in partnership with uh, Every Learner Everywhere. Uh, and the playbook addresses the differences in rules that apply uh, when instruction goes from a face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to some sort of uh, online, remote, hybrid, or any sort of digital variations that the uh, different rules apply as you uh, move from one to the other. Uh, and then to begin, we'll have uh, our friend Fred Locken uh, give us a high-level overview of the uh, election results uh, at both the federal and a bit at the state level as well. Uh, and he'll give us some observations on the aftermath from that too. Uh, Fred is a professor at Truckee Meadows Community College uh, and he's a political scientist by trade and has deep knowledge of the uh, political and governmental scenes. Um, Fred is also one of the three uh, governor appointed Ritchie commissioners for the state of Nevada. Uh, so that makes him one of our bosses as well. So we'll be extra nice to Fred through all this. Uh, before turning to Fred uh, in a moment, I just want to remind you that to use the Q&A to ask questions. Uh, uh, we might address a few as we go through, but uh, mostly we'll get, address the questions at the end. So uh, we do want your questions as we move forward. 
Fred, it's time for you. Go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you very, very much. And I'm sure all of you are excited to see electoral college maps. Uh, it, it just brings it back to the evening of November 3rd, I'm sure. Uh, I, I enjoy this task assignment, although I accept it as being a bit daunting to try to explain any election in recent times. But I thought I'd start with a very brief comparative uh, discussion about the 2016 versus the 2020 election. As you all uh, had to have a civics election uh, or uh, education in 2016, we had to be reminded that, that although we do a popular vote, uh, our founders always had an electoral college in place that actually made the decision of who the president would be. So in 2016, in the race between Trump and Clinton, we had a popular victory for Hillary Clinton, the more than or almost 3 million votes. But in the Electoral College, Donald Trump carried 306 electoral votes and needed 270 to win. Uh, under that circumstances, uh, we have had that happen before in American history. Uh, most recently in, in 2000, as a result of the Supreme Court decision on the hanging Chad issue of Florida. But it's been infrequent. And I think for a lot of Americans, uh, it's unsettling. Uh, we think we're in a democracy, but we're in an odd democracy. We're in an elitist democracy where a, a body uh, has more authority than the voice of the people. The people trigger the determination of the electoral college in the sense of usually a winner take all, each state establishing a slate of electors that goes forward based on their popular vote. But there's a distorting effect. And uh, we've had a great deal of discussion about the Electoral College since 2016, and we need to be reminded that the founders included this not as a, a vehicle for protecting small states. That was the great compromise in the creation of the United States Senate, where all states were equal. The Electoral College was created to protect Southern slave states so that they would not have to fear, or that they would not have a mechanism by which they could countermand a popular vote that favored an anti-slave president. And we are dealing with that now in 2016 and again in 2020. So all of us changed our focus between 2016 to 2020 on the Electoral College, because we realize now that the popular vote doesn't always work. And in the 2020 election, if we can move to the next slide, uh, as those maps indicated, there was an interesting flip between 2016 and 2020. This time around, uh, the winner was Joe Biden, and he carried the exact same number of electoral votes that uh, Donald Trump did in 2016. But as those maps indicate, what, what Joe Biden succeeded in doing in this election was reestablishing the blue wall in the northern part of the country, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, they had been voting Democrat up till the moment of, of uh, Donald Trump. He had been able to flip four states with less than 90,000 votes total in the electoral win in those, those four states and helped him to that 306 electoral votes. This time around, Biden was able to pull those states back into the Democratic column. And that along with the unexpected victories in Arizona and in Georgia, gave him the 306 electoral votes this time around. It, I, you know, it's more than coincidence, I've got to swear. Biden also won by more than 7 million votes, I think from the final count, it's a little close to 7 million right now, and he earned over 80 million votes, which is the largest electoral victory, uh, uh, victory of any uh, president. It's the greatest number of, of votes that ever, ever has been cast for a presidential candidate. But remember that Donald Trump did get 73 million. And under that sense, uh, this was a better election. We had had a 57% turnout in 2016. Uh, we have not got the official number here, but it'll probably be in the mid 60s, my, my expectation, which reminds us that even as important as this election was seen by many, a third of American voters stayed home on election day on November 3rd. And that remains a real problem for our democracy. We have a disengagement, a very significant disengagement. And um, we see underperforming across the board uh, in all participation. But remember that in many of our states now, we have a very large number of independent slash nonpartisan voters, many of which are moderate Republican refugees from the Republican Party. They are very much disengaged. They are not really campaigned to very much. 
And uh, that is a reservoir of potential voters that are sitting out there that need to be tapped. We also have a significant number of disillusioned Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we are not very fond of our two-party system right now. In the overview of this, that in the US Senate race, we of course saw that uh, there was a very tight situation. We're waiting to see the outcome of the Georgia uh, runoff elections on January 5th, but at this point in time, it will decide the makeup of the United States Senate. And in the House, uh, the Democrats lost ground uh, and are now down to at, at least 222 seats. There are still a couple of seats to be resolved, but the resolutions have been favoring the Republicans so far. Uh, and so they lost ground in that. And so in, in moving on to the next slide, we uh, realized that there are a number of things that have bubbled up here. And if we walk away from anything from my 10 minute conversation with you, it's that we saw a lot of split ticket voting, a lot of split ballot voting, and a lot of, of uh, thinking that dual party rule is a good idea in 2020. This may be the democracy trying to reestablish itself, uh, the voters themselves trying to figure out a way by which they can help fix our political process. There, there is a message here if the parties want to hear it, which is that a growing number of Americans don't trust one or the other party to be in control. They want both in there, which has kind of created much of the gridlock that we see in Washington, which the voters hate. But what the voters want is movement. They want, I think, a return to compromise, probably a return to middle ground, not all the way to the right, not all the way to the left. And, and that message, I think, can be found in this election. We also saw a lot of voters that had a particular view on the presidential race and then returned to their party. So a number of Republicans crossed over to vote for Joe Biden to establish his electoral victory, but they went down ticket with the Republicans for the rest of the ballot, which gave Republicans a sound performance in the Senate races, the House races, and especially in the state races. Uh, we are now dealing with a fairly unprecedented accusation or set of accusations about the legitimacy of this election. It's been playing out in the process that we have in place. Uh, I think public opinion has, uh, has made a decision on this. Certainly a sizable number of court decisions have spoken. Even the attorney general uh, this week spoke on the legitimacy of this race, but uh, we are still seeing some challenges play out. We again saw the failure of national polling, and uh, we'd all been told that there was likely a big Democratic wave that never materialized. Uh, there was a level of Republican enthusiasm that was not replicated in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party still reflects the progressive moderate split uh, that is already hounding uh, President-elect Biden as he makes uh, selections for his administration. We also set another record for spending money on this race. Each candidate for president spent over $2 billion each in this race, the, the, the setting, um, again, breaking a record that really had been established just four years ago. And of course, we conducted a major national election in the midst of a pandemic. What were we thinking? Uh, we have to do it, and we did it, and I think we did it remarkably well. Next slide. And uh, just to have a sense of the state races, uh, be, uh, when Russ and I were talking about this, it's, it's the story that hasn't really been told in this election since November 3rd, because the focus has been on the drama between um, you know, the challenges to the legitimacy of the, of the presidential election. But Republicans did remarkably well. They can feel very good about performance at the state level. They, again, mostly retained. The Democrats failed to flip a single legislative chamber, which was their goal. I mean, all of us remember enough of our, our political science to know that reapportionment is coming in 2021 based on the 2020 census, if the census is ever completed. Uh, and we uh, would recognize that who is in control of the state houses and who's in control of the legislatures in those states really dictates how those lines will be drawn and will impact our politics for the next decade. Uh, in this sense, the Republicans remain in the driver's seat in being able to draw those lines in a way that favor Republican candidates. Uh, gerrymandering is real. It tends to be legitimized. Uh, the Supreme Court refuses to wade into that argument. So uh, each state has to have this argument about how political these lines should be. But I wanted to give you the numbers of where the distribution is because Republicans uh, pulled this off in the 2010 uh, election 
uh, and swept into these state houses and drew the lines in 2011. We've been seeing that implication for this last decade. We are now seeing it sustained by this Republican majority at the state level. And it has implications for policy. There is just no doubt uh, we have this dichotomy and it returns to what was an emerging theme, at least on the Democratic side of the ticket, of the need for compromise, for bipartisanship, for listening to each other and for finding middle ground. If we're successful, I think Ban's conversation will, be, uh, will, will also be successful, but we just don't know what kind of Washington we've inherited at this point in time. And we're going to have to wait till January 20th and beyond to know. In the final observations here, the damage to the electoral system, we don't know the extent of this, but we haven't had it challenged to this degree. It seems to be undermining potential Republican support in the political process, far more than Democratic support. Uh, and one cannot factor at this time to what end. We have transition turmoil, which uh, has occurred in the Republic before. I, it looks like the Biden administration's handling that. The, the division of the Senate's going to be real no matter who wins it. It's going to be razor thin no matter who wins it. And the personalities in terms of leadership and the, uh, the feelings of, of addressing the problems that the country has, there is a real desire by the voters to, to see that. We are looking at an effort to pass a bipartisan stimulus program. This may be a window into what our politics will look like under a Biden administration. And of course, uh, time is, uh, the jury is out as to how Biden will be successful and to where our policy implications will go. But as the final observation, I think for Joe Biden, uh, the challenge that he has is dealing with his own progressive wing. The, the tighter the Senate is, the, the, the more that, that the dual party rule and, and the, the notion of working together is there actually unfetters him from maintaining a strong commitment to the progressive wing because politics will necessarily have to move to the middle. Otherwise, he's going to be having that argument during the entire four years of his presidency. Thanks, Fred. So let's talk about what's going to happen with, uh, potentially happen with uh, higher education under a Biden administration. And I think we have to sort of ask ourselves, are we looking at a brave new world? And probably not, at least not initially. As Fred pointed out, um, even if the two Georgia seats end up going to the Democratic Party, that's gonna be an even split in the Senate. Uh, even if they don't go, um, it's such a small margin. With the, and then in, term, in addition to that, we see a diminished number of Democrats in the House. Um, all in all, I don't think we've got a legislative branch that's going to have a congressional majority that's filibuster proof. So most likely, we're not going to see any initial significant changes to higher education policy. Um, it is though, I think, still worth taking a look at what the Biden administration's higher education plan was during the campaign, because I think that it, in that we see some ideas of what Biden's policy priorities for higher education may look like. And I, I love, the, you know, I have great respect for Terry Hartle over at ACE, and, and I love what he said in the Chronicle of Higher Education recently, um, that we'll be looking at a once in a generation effort to invest in America's students. So with that, let's take a look at what the Biden administration's higher education plan is. During the election, uh, the Biden team put out this plan for education beyond high school. And there are three primary components to that. The first is an investment in community college training to improve student success. The second is strengthening college as the reliable pathway to the middle class, not a reliable pathway, but the reliable pathway. And then the third prong was uh, supporting colleges and universities that play a unique and vital role in their communities. So let's take a look at that first one in terms of investing in community college training to improve student success. Uh, next slide, please, Megan. So, there's four main components. There's several components to this, but there's four that I wanna draw your attention to um, this afternoon. Um, the first is that two years of community college or other high quality training program uh, students could have without debt. 
the second huge component that I want to draw your attention to is this idea of community college student success grants. The third is $500 billion in workforce training. And then the fourth component would be a billion dollars for community college facilities and new technologies. So I don't think that, that it is any mistake uh, or a coincidence that community colleges are such heavily represented in Biden's higher education plan. I think that this is a direct result of the fact that Dr. Jill Biden uh, will continue to be a community college English professor who has spent most of her career working with students who are historically underrepresented. Uh, and <clears throat> she has brought that passion um, into the White House with her. And it's a passion that President-elect Biden shares. A couple of things that I wanna draw your attention to. And again, we're talking about this in theory. Um, the likelihood of any of this actually passing is probably pretty small. However, I think that it does show the seeds of what we might see in coronavirus relief for higher education, or if we're able to get something through um, reconciliation, budget reconciliation to sneak some of this budget funding through. And the one I really want to draw your attention to is that $500 billion in workforce training. Because I think what's likely to happen is that any workforce training, major workforce training investment is going to first of all be focused on community colleges. It's gonna look a lot like what the TACT grants did from the early Obama administration. And what we know of those TACT grants was that there was a digital component that was required of each of those grants. So I think that, that as we see um, a renewed interest in workforce training, and that's something that likely has some bipartisan support, maybe not $500 billion worth of bipartisan support, but bipartisan support, that we're going to see digital learning play an important key in that training. And then also there is this recognition that the infrastructure in community colleges is not present in the way that it needs to be um, with that suggestion that there would be a $1 billion investment for community college facilities and new technologies. So let's take a look at the second prong of this plan and that's strengthening college, back when, there we go, the strengthening college is a reliable pathway. This is the free college portion of the Biden plan uh, that would make tuition free college for families making less than $125,000. Uh, that would be first dollar money, which means that that comes in first and then Pell could be used to um, cover other expenses. Uh, there is a suggestion of doubling the maximum Pell award. And then there is, and I've quoted it here, um, this sort of throwaway of stopping for-profit educational programs from profiteering off of students. And again, one of the things that I want to sort of um, touch on here is, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to see a tuition-free college program emerge, at least in the short run. Doubling Pell maximum grant actually has some bipartisan support to it. There's an irony in this. If any of this is to pass, the short-term response would likely be an increase in student enrollments, but it's gonna be an increase in student enrollments at institutions that most likely have been devastated by the pandemic and do not have the resources for those students. So we're in a little bit of, a, of, a, of an ironic situation here that anything that happens that's going to increase student enrollment will in the long run probably help institutions by shoring up enrollment numbers that have plummeted because of the pandemic. However, it's going to increase those enrollments at the time when their budgetary responses are at the most critical and they have the least amount of resources to invest in what are probably going to be very high risk student populations. And then finally, let's look at that last um, plank in the, in the plan. And that's strengthening college, excuse me, that's supporting colleges and universities that play unique and vital roles in their communities. Uh, so this is really focused on historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. Um, Biden has proposed a $70 billion investment in those institutions. 20 billion of that has been earmarked for infrastructure. 10 billion has been earmarked for enrollment, retention and student success. Again, obviously if any of this is to pass, there have to be significant bipartisan support. Um, <clears throat> I think what it does do is it highlights that this is an administration that sees that infrastructure investment needs to take place for all institutions, but especially for those institutions um, that serve historically underrepresented student groups. 
Uh, and then another piece of this for the Biden plan that also I think has some bipartisan support, although maybe not $20 billion worth, is this idea of a $20 billion investment in rural broadband. Um, certainly one of the things that's happened because of the pandemic is that the digital divide has been laid bare. The digital divide has existed, it's not new, but we are unable to ignore it in ways that we've been able to ignore it in the past. And one of those groups that we have seen disproportionately impacted by that digital divide is rural institutions and their students. So what do we take away from this? Well, first of all, digital learning probably isn't at the top of the Biden administration's priority list. Um, there's that pandemic that needs to be taken care of. Um, even to the extent that digital learning is going to come into play, it is most likely going to happen through things like indirectly through stimulus funding or Department of Education regulatory uh, actions. And I think that there's two really important things we have to remember about the Department of Education. One of those is that it has been decimated over the last four years. The latest number I saw was around the, the department is down some 800 staff members, and many of those are career staff. They're not just political appointees. We also know that the department has the worst morale of any federal agency its side, its size rather. And so the department is going to have to rebuild itself. And that rebuilding is going to take a little bit of time. Um, we know that Title IX, we know that borrower defense, we know that closing um, the 9010 loophole are almost likely to be the immediate gainful employment, are almost likely to be the immediate regulatory interests from the Department of Ed. And then we've got that Higher Education Act that still hasn't been reauthorized and it's not gonna be authorized anytime soon. Um, and then finally, the last thing that we have going on is who may take leadership of the Higher Education uh, Labor and Pension Committee um, in the Senate. That's been Lamar Alexander, an ex-Department of Education, Secretary of Department of Education and an ex-Chancellor of a university. Uh, one of the names that potentially, if the Republicans keep control of the Senate, uh, one of the names that has been floated as taking uh, chairmanship over help is Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. And I think it's safe to say that higher education is likely not to be a priority for Senator Paul. So is anything changing? Not anytime soon, but I think we've got some glimpses here of how things might change for digital learning, especially if we're able to get some of that stimulus funding through. And I'm gonna turn to Cheryl so that she can talk a little bit more about the regulatory landscape uh, and, and what we've been dealing with for the last several months. Thanks very much, Van, appreciate that. Uh, what Van and Fred have shared with you all really looks forward and uh, was, was fascinating to listen to as well. But uh, what I'm gonna do is kind of look back a little bit and share with you all what we've done in reaction to um, some of the things that have transpired in the last year. We all know that last spring, we saw the start of the unprecedented use of the word unprecedented. And uh, so this COVID pandemic caused our institutions that are offering face-to-face -face instruction to rapidly switch to remote instruction. And so we saw our institutions, you know, going through the challenges that were technological challenges, pedagogical challenges, and administrative challenges, while also trying to help their faculty with new technology tools, um, while kind of keeping an eye on federal and state regulations um, that were occurring. Uh, we know that as of last March, the Department of Education started offering a number of waivers and regulatory interpretations about distance education and managing the remote, um, the remote landscape. But we do know that accreditors and states also have requirements that may be separate from federal requirements. So it's a management of all of this while also understanding that um, there was going to be new regulations that were gonna be coming into play July 1, 2020. So even the most uh, knowledgeable person at the institution had a big job to try to manage waivers, flexibilities, uh, new regulations and things that weren't going to change. Um, however, when you saw an institution have their courses move from face-to-face -face instruction to remote instruction, there were different applicable regulations and requirements um, that needed to be maintained. So 
So early last summer, as we saw that the pandemic was going to press on to affect the summer terms and the fall 2020 terms, and, and now it looks like in the spring 2021 term, uh, staff members at WCET and SAN, as, as uh, Russ had shared with the support of Every Learner Everywhere, prepared a resource. And it's the Pursuing Regulatory Compliance for Digital Instruction in Response to COVID-19 Policy Playbook. R rolls right off your tongue, doesn't it? Uh, we released this playbook um, last September, um, just a few months ago, and it was intended to be um, a shortcut for uh, faculty members and administrators to understand what needed to be managed as they were moving from a face-to-face -face environment to remote instruction and trying to balance out what was required and what the situation was if there were any um, waivers or flexibilities that were being offered um, in those areas. So to do that, next uh, slide, please. And I believe somebody put, the, put that in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, so the playbook as it is, and you saw the link to that, has um, a number of key topic areas. And we presented it in a way that is a concise and easy to use guide about the most significant regulatory issues that are impacting digital learning. So we looked at first accreditation. So we're talking about programmatic and institutional accreditation. How, you know, how must an institution look at what their accreditor requirements are when they're moving from a face-to-face -to, -face to remote situation? Also, what about with financial aid? Are you, there are certain uh, requirements in regard to distance education, last date of attendance. And also we've been writing quite a bit about the GI Bill benefits. Then there's state authorization. And when we're talking about state authorization, we're talking about out of state activity compliance. So we're seeing a number of institutions have their, their students dispersed throughout the country and having to ensure that they are in compliance with the uh, laws and regulations of the states where the students are located. Many of the institutions participate in reciprocity through SARA for their institutional compliance, but there are some institutions that don't participate including in the state of California, um, that needed to be aware of what the states were requiring, as well as professional licensure state program approvals. So I was talking about institutional compliance, but also just program apply compliance and approvals that may be required uh, for certain programs. And then of course, new student notifications that were part of the July 1, 2020 um, uh, new regulations that became effective. You all may recall that uh, the federal um, the federal rulemaking came to consensus in spring of 2019 with regulations that were going to be in three packages. And those three packages, the first package became effective July 1 of this year. We're looking forward to July 1 of 2021 of the other two packages becoming effective. So moving on then to course level regulations, there are concerns about student identity verification and fair use of digital materials. So understanding that. And then finally, uh, student civil rights, important to know about accessibility. I wanna point out um, uh, that last slide just very quickly that uh, on that last slide, it had a list on the right side of certain topic areas where we did a deeper dive in those issues, accreditation, accessibility, financial aid basics and the basics of state authorization so that people can have a, a little bit more context about those areas um, and they are accessible through that document. So looking forward, next slide. So um, as we're looking forward, we saw that these flexibilities by the department were offered in uh, March, but we're seeing a lessening of flexibilities. So be aware as you move forward, there's a lessening of these flexibilities and waivers. There could be an end of flexibilities and waivers. I understood that uh, Diane Hour Jones from the Department of Education spoke the other day, and there was not an extension of a date um, for the extension of the um, flexibilities that were offered by the department. They had said roughly the end of a national um, emergency, but we don't really have an end date other than the end of this calendar year. Um, also be aware that waiver and flexibilities by the department do not necessarily apply to state requirements or some accreditor oversight. So you might wanna keep that in mind as you're looking at what you're providing in the spring 2021 semester. Uh, and uh, let's uh, go back to answering some questions. I'm sure that uh, 
we've covered a lot of material today, so I'll leave, leave this to Russ. Excellent, excellent. And then do uh, use the Q and A, uh, everyone, in order to uh, uh, in order to provide questions. And then, uh, uh, Fred, I'm going to come to you first with a with a, a question. I hope this works out well for you in terms of your role uh, in you know working in the state and as a witchy commissioner. But uh, uh, Van talked uh, quite a bit about what might be happening at the federal level. I was wondering if you're seeing trends in terms of uh, uh, what states might be doing in terms of what are the challenges that they're facing as legislators, governors in with higher education and, and if there's anything in terms of digital learning or what you're seeing. I know there's 50 states in, in all sorts of uh, responses, but if are you seeing any any trends coming out of that? So. Well, the great question. And the big issues, first and foremost, are uh, resources. Uh, states have been devastated by the pandemic. Uh, you know, most every state is dealing with budget holes. Some are much as in the Great Recession uh, in a better position than others, but most states uh, did not anticipate this hit so close to the recession. We also have the prospect of, a, of another recession if we're not careful, which would come on top of the pandemic. So with the absence of cash flow, what we're seeing, for instance, in the state of Nevada are budget cuts uh, and built-in budget cuts for the next biennium which takes resources away at a time when most campuses had not adequately invested in uh, certainly their digital delivery uh, and transformation. There are all kinds of specific needs that WCET would happily identify uh, are essential for a successful uh, distance learning program. And they all have been horribly understaffed in doing the best job they can in making this transition of the entire curriculum uh, to, to the virtual world. But one would anticipate that they are anticipating that additional resources will flow their way. And that's the first major barrier. Most campuses won't get additional monies that uh, they can then direct to their digital programs to improve their quality and their reliability uh, to their students. So that is a, a major issue. Uh, beyond that, I, I think what Van raised, uh, I think everyone is beginning to appreciate how inadequate the infrastructure is for the 21st century. For many of us, we, we learned as university and, and college students, our, our, and even our faculty, do not have the bandwidth that they should have to be able to be fully functional online, nor do they, in some cases, have the access to it. So rural is critical, but when, when Van was reporting on that, I honestly think that in any infrastructure effort nationally, the states would be hoping that they would also be looking at the at sort of the decay of the urban infrastructure. Uh, it has been heavily taxed. Every aspect of the bandwidth has never been used to this degree. And I, I think we're looking at an entire restructuring of our infrastructure and bandwidth to make it uh, in support of education and the economy. So I think those are two really major issues at the state level. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how uh, there's a lot of people moving into the urban areas now. There's a lot moving out, you know, and what, what will be the impact of that in terms of making sure that the uh, infrastructure is there? You know, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, Van, we, uh, we have a, a question about the Biden administration, I'd like to uh, come to you from that from uh, from one of our attendees and then the question is as the biden higher ed policy develops do you anticipate that the policies will be uh, similar to the obama policies or will the obama policies be a starting point with biden going uh, further or in some different direction i think that they're going to be very similar um, to the obama policies um, especially around workforce development um, and those tax grants uh, we had already this last year, um, what was dubbed mini tact grants that wasn't in response to the pandemic, it just happened to coincide with it, that um, there were small workforce development grants that, you know, again, aimed at community colleges, digital learning is a critical piece of that. Uh, I think when you look at gainful employment, when you look at borrower to defense, when you look at closing the 9010 loophole, all of those were things that uh, were dealt with during the Obama administration. And those are all issues that are likely to be at the front and center, I think, of the regulatory response, at least here at the beginning of the Biden administration. So I think that I think that what we can do is, is look at what we saw during the Obama administration as a good template for what we are likely to see. Uh, and But I don't think that we can emphasize too much um, that Ed really is 
as a department been hurt during the last four years and it is going to take the department quite a bit of time to really staff back up and come back up to speed uh, and that we're still probably not going to see a higher education uh, reauthorization and we're still going to be dealing with um, a split senate uh, any way that you cut it that's not going to be filibuster proof so you know, it's in many ways, I think we're looking at more of the same, unfortunately, um, for higher education, at least. Van, could I have you do the the, uh, the the quick 30 second update, maybe on what gainful employment and the 9010 rules are and, and why those are interesting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, explain the universe in 30 seconds. Please, Van. A... <laughs> oh, thanks, or, or Ross. Pick, pick your favorite, maybe. Um, so the 9010 loophole, and I may get this wrong because I'm not a financial aid guy, um, but the 9010 loophole, the idea here is that um, institutions should not be receiving, 90% of what they receive should not be federal funds. There's a loophole that has to do with veterans benefits, gainful employment um, was this idea that institutions largely community colleges and technical colleges needed to show that their students were ga being gainfully employed, not underemployed, not unemployed, but gainfully employed in the area that they studied um, in order for those institutions to continue to be eligible for financial aid. So both of them are seen as accountability measures. Okay. Yeah. How is that, Russ? Oh, that, that's good. That's good. And, and so the, yeah, the 9010 is much more around for-profits and uh, yeah. how they counted veterans and in the gainful employment that there's a, uh, a lot of different institutions going to have to figure out how they will fit into that and watch for the new rules on that as those roll out. Uh, with that, uh, Cheryl, I'm going to come to you next uh, for this uh, question that we have, and this has to do with the international students. And Cheryl, you know, what are the issues in regards to international students uh, located outside of the U.S. and that they've enrolled in an online uh, program or course? That's a real challenge and is a challenge, you know, regardless of a pandemic. Um, the, the situation is that countries have their own uh, oversight rules, much like our states all have different oversight rules. And so there are uh, multiple things that must be considered, whether the country uh, or if they're broken up into provinces or territories like Canada for their oversight, whether they have oversight of distance education, um, are there tax laws that are applicable? Um, we've heard um, that there are some digital uh, tax laws. We've also heard um, that there are concerns in regard to privacy. Of course, the um, European GDPR um, is a concern as well. So an institution would be um, wise to communicate with some sort of legal counsel to determine what's required by those countries. So the bottom line is, is that just as the states each have their own laws about who can enroll and what who can what institutions can enroll people and what they can do, that each country has those rules as well. And you know, by God, even though we're the U.S., that they're we're expected to follow those rules. Is that right? Yes, and um, we have had great communication with some colleagues at Hogan Levels who have given us a number of resources. So if you are interested in finding out more, um, the uh, SAN website, WCET SAN, um, also has a, a four or five uh, resources that were prepared by Hogan Levels uh, about international online education programs. And I strongly urge you to review their work. They do a good job um, and it can give you some understanding of why there are nuances that need to be, um, that the institution needs to be aware of. Excellent. Yeah. Do you want to put that uh, link in sure. the chat? That'd be great. That'd be good. Uh, here's a question. I think it's more for uh, Fred or Van. We'll see who, who would like to go after it. And, and have there been any indicators to how any potential funding programs from the feds will be dispersed? Uh, I'm especially curious if individual institutions, organizations will receive direct grants or will come down as block grants to the uh, to the states. And I assume they're talking about any uh, additional stimulus that might that might come through at this point. So uh, who would like to take that? Let's see. I'm deferring the ban. <laughs> okay. All right. I so some of these, if the funding was to pass, and again, that, that is a huge, huge, huge if, um, it, it would likely 
be primarily institutional grants um, with some exceptions. Um, I think as Fred pointed out, um, the states are going to be very interested in the infrastructure um, money. There's some um, requirements for the um, free tuition program that a portion of it would have to be um, matched by states. So I think though that we're likely to be looking mostly at institutional grants if this type of funding was to pass. Now, the other question that's at play is what might there be in higher education in, um, in any sort of additional stimulus bills and whether or not stimulus funding would go directly to institutions or whether or not stimu stimulus funding would go to states. Um, we had it happen both ways in the CARES Act. Um, there've been some pushback against that. Uh, and so it's, I think it's really just going to come down to how the funding ends up being passed by Congress. And I would add that uh, uh, certainly we are seeing the first attempt at compromise with this, uh, this it's not even really a stimulus, uh, it's more of a compassion bill that's before the, uh, the Senate and House today. And uh, that's $160 billion for states that certainly the Democrats have been arguing for. But everyone is indicating the likely need for another, after Biden becomes president in January 20th, some sort of a stimulus package. You know, we have, again, a risk of recession. The indicators on the economy are not moving in the right way. The desire to help us pull out of the, uh, the pandemic more quickly. So in any kind of a stimulus bill, much as they are looking to attach this current bill to the budget next week, there would be an attempt, I think, to to have a very large omnibus bill for, uh, for infrastructure that could touch on a lot of different things, but could be something that would spend anywhere from one to $3 trillion on, on uh, various projects that could touch on education, broadband, highway infrastructure. I think we're, we're back to almost the Great Depression of looking at a monolith bill uh, of just trying to put money everywhere in the economy to save jobs and, and to, to re-stimulate the economy. And at the end of the day, money spent on education is one of the best ways to stimulate the economy. So that's where that could occur. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what what states do as well. I know Colorado just had a special, and we were in Colorado, just had a special session and they uh, put money into uh, uh, broadband infrastructure in the state that they had. And so it was interesting that they did, they did that. And also, uh, Fred, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that this by now, in terms of the very what we've seen in terms of talking to other witchy commissioners and shios in the in the West and throughout the U.S., but there's great variability in terms of the speed that they've spent the current stimulus package. They spent a lot of the uh, student fo focus money like right away, but some states are just now getting to spending the rest of that money. I was kind of surprised by that. But. Well, there's a lot of confusion. I think for any of the of the participants. The CARES Act was appreciated money if you could figure out how you could spend it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I think a lot of, if you get into some states, if, if they're very pensive or conservative, they've, they've just been sitting on it trying to figure out that what they were doing was going to be legal, trying to get answers back from the government with the phone not ringing. Uh, and when there was talk about creating a new CARES Act, one of the immediate first things was to build a lot more clarity into what you could spend it for. A lot of campuses have been finding out what they can't spend it for. Problem is that they already had spent it that way. So now it's creating a new financial difficulty that because they have to replenish that money because they're told it's wrong. So it, you know, there was a lot of confusion with that. Okay. And we have a, another question here that I'm going to expand on and uh, uh, see who would like to, to tackle this. But the, the, the base question from uh, 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 Michael, uh, hello, Michael, uh, is the one about who do you think will be appointed uh, Secretary of Education? And let, let's go beyond that. Uh, and it'd probably be a little bit easier to uh, probably think about what type of person or what type of Department of Education, what is going to be some of the things that they're going to focus on, you know, with the, with the new secretary coming in, what are some things that will be the focus of a, of a new secretary? And so, uh, uh, who would like to start with that one? I'll, I'll start with it. Okay. Um, so Biden has said that he wants somebody who has been a public school teacher to be the next secretary of education. There's two names that are being bandied about quite a bit right now. Uh, Randy Weingarten, who is the president of the American Federation of Teachers name is being bandied about. And then 
uh, Lily Eskelson Garcia, who is just recently stepped down as the president of the National Education Association. So both of those names have been bandied about quite a bit. I think interestingly enough, one of the folks who was um, originally sort of being talked about, Linda Darling Hammond um, from California, uh, has been very clear that she has no desire to be the next secretary of education. However, she has been chosen to um, handle as the primary education person for the Biden transition team. Um, either way you slice or dice it, most likely the secretary of education is gonna have a K-12 background. Um, that is historically the way it often is. Um, there've been some exceptions. Betsy DeVos is one of those exceptions. Lamar Alexander was one of those exceptions. Um, but most likely there's going to be a K-12 focus amongst the, for the Secretary of Education. Um, I think that, that Ed is going to be immediately focused on um, Title IX regulations. Ed is going to be immediately focused on things like um, gainful employment, borrower defense. Um, quite frankly, one of the biggest logistical issues that the department is going to have to figure out how to deal with is what to do once student loans, uh, student loan repayment restarts. Uh, right now, they're looking at a logistical nightmare uh, in terms of student loan repayments restarting um, since right now that's scheduled to restart on January 1st, 2021. And the department has is it's not like a, a switch that can be flipped on and off for that. Um, so I think that it's going to be logistical issues are going to be of the immediate concern for the department, especially since they're down staff and, and the morale is not as good as it once was. Um, I think consumer protection is going to continue to be a, a significant issue for the Department of Education. We've already heard some folks um, lobbying for a weakening of reciprocity uh, under the guise of consumer protection. I think we're gonna to continue to have those sort of conversations around reciprocity and consumer protection as well. State authorization reciprocity, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, okay. yeah, state authorization reciprocity. Okay. Fred, do you have a take? I don't see. Dan is spot on. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there is a tradition in appointments uh, the Interior Secretary, invariably somebody from the West, the, you know, education strongly K-12. Uh, serve a far larger number of students than at the higher education level. And uh, as we know, America has a problem with K-12 education uh, and uh, its ability to perform. So uh, all of that's true. I know that there is talk of possibly uh, Biden has advocated a $10,000 uh, student loan forgiveness that would uh, possibly be front-ended. Uh, the inability to cancel the entire debt because of its size, or at least to do it quickly, but to get some relief out there in that format as well. Uh, but uh, the uh, undoing what has been done, and frankly, the Democrats favor more regulation, the Republicans less. And so uh, there are clearly a number of, of, of deregulation activities by the, the uh, administration, the current administration, that are targeted to be addressed because uh, you know, there's a real strong philosophical difference about what the educational process should be doing and not doing, and who should be favored and not. Uh, and so I think in the first year, especially that, you know, they'll, they'll be identifying all of those regulations that they see need to be reintroduced. And, and Cheryl, uh, I'm not going to pick on you to uh, pick a, a secretary here, but it, but you come at this from a compliance standpoint. What, what differences do you see uh, in terms of compliance from a new department? Well, I, I think, you know, as uh, Fred was talking about how there had been deregulation and that the new department will look at that and see how they can re, re um, introduce, you know, the regulations. Uh, we know that the Trump administration came in wanting to deregulate and remove a number of regulations. Compliance was not high on their priority list in a way that I think the upcoming administration will be. So we we knew we had these rules, regulations, requirements in place, um, but they weren't something that we think that, uh, and plus, as Van pointed out, the department was very understaffed. And so uh, we know that that wasn't a priority in that administration. And I don't anticipate that's going to be the case in the next administration. 
Plus, you know, and, and Russ, you and I talk about this all the time, not only is there compliance, but there's also concern about private lawsuits. And if there's a regulation in place and uh, there's a private lawsuit, but there's a regulation that requires that the institution be doing something and they're not, um, you know, that is a, is a struggle um, for the institution in the event of a private lawsuit. So I, I worry about those things as well. Okay, okay. And if somebody could take, we got uh, one more question and maybe just a quick take on this. Is there something uh, that the, uh, the secretary, current secretary DeVos and uh, uh, her political staff could be doing on the way out that we need, uh, that we would need to worry about? We're, we're seeing some other activities like that in terms of the Department of Education, or do we want to I personally, I had seen that in the chat. I don't think so, just to, stylistically, I think she's already disconnected, uh, which usually is what happens in transition. Uh, you know, it's lame duck now. I mean, the, the, you have the authority, but it, in my mind, is inappropriate to exercise it at this stage. Uh, we are seeing problems elsewhere. I think more focus is on the Defense Department and what's what's happened there under the Trump administration and why it's happened at this stage with, you know, some um, I think 70, no, not 70, I think a month and a half now left uh, before the inauguration. Uh, those changes are usually done uh, if you're going to be uh, mounting an operation that they've been resisting, you put new people in it. Hopefully it's just revenge, but we don't know what's going on in defense. And, and Fred, we're almost uh, done. I'm going to stick with you while you uh, uh, have the mic here. And then a prediction, a very quick prediction for uh, what might happen in the next year or two. So. Well, I think all of it, it's a prediction of a normative prediction. What should happen, I think, <laughs> is an awakening of common sense in America that we have been based on compromise for our entire existence. We work best when we do. And I don't have a flag, so I'll wave my tie. But the, uh, the reality is that uh, the alternative, which is this excessive polarization of our political process, uh, is a destructive path. No good comes from it. it. It just tears us apart, it divides. But true compromise, if you think back in education, some of our absolute best modifications to HEA have, have occurred that way. Uh, we have been able to make some of the greatest reforms in both K-12 and higher education through bipartisan activity. Our foreign policy has always been far more consistent and well-received. So in the, it, we'll be looking for those tests, but I, I'm thinking that there's a growing feeling in both of the legislative chambers that middle ground is not such a bad place, that half a loaf is okay at this stage to stabilize the democracy, deal with the, the myriad of issues that are facing us and that have been delayed for too long. So I'm an internal optimist. I think in my view, we are going to see the first real movement towards uh, compromise that we've seen in our political process in probably 30 years. And Cheryl, do you have a quick uh, prediction? Quick prediction. Uh, I, I think what's really interesting is we look at four years ago at this time and we were just on the eve of receiving the um, new state authorization and professional licensure notification regulations. I don't even remember that, Russ. That was kind of a big deal at the time. Uh, Russ jumped on that very fast. Um, so I, that was kind of a joke that he jumped on it. I don't anticipate that uh, there is anything on the horizon between now um, and the end of uh, this administration. But I do, again, um, I think that compliance is an issue. I think that institutions need to be aware of what's required of them and uh, be working uh, towards meeting those requirements. That's, that's, that's my biggest concern at, right now um, is the compliance of institutions. And Van, you and, get the last word. Um, sorry about that. I'm not as much of an optimist as Fred is. Um, I'm a historian, so I come by my cynicism, honestly. Um, I think that we're going to see, I, I, I think we're gonna see more gridlock. I don't think that we're going to see the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act anytime soon. Um, I, and without the reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, then I think that it's gonna to continue to sort of push um, the Department of Ed um, into being a, department that is making policy through regulatory action. Uh, and I don't think that that's really going to change. Um, like Cheryl pointed out, like Fred pointed out, you know, there is a philosophical difference between Republicans and Democrats around the idea of regulation. I think that we'll see more, the department be more interested in regulatory affairs. Um, but I don't think we're going to see any huge changes um, coming down the pike anytime soon. 
Great, and and I need to uh, to move us along, uh, and then I'll give a quick prediction. It has to do with uh, digital learning. The efficacy of digital learning is going to come under uh, greater scrutiny, and that especially uh, the chasm between uh, legislators and governors in terms of the idea of price versus cost, and uh, uh, that they're think they're faced with an affordability issue that certainly uh, using technology should uh, make things cheaper. With that, I wanna thank uh, all of you uh, for this great session. I wanna thank uh, Megan and Kim who are behind the scenes and make everything run smoothly so that we actually uh, all look good here and making this go. And with that, uh, thank you all. I'm gonna turn it back to Megan. Great, thank you. And we are right at the top of the hour, so I'll just jump off quickly. But I do wanna thank all of the participants for joining us today. Thank you, Cheryl, Van, Fred, and Russ. Take care, all. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.